So now that you've had a chance to look at what the periodic trends do at, on the periodic table, let's go back and talk about what the trends are and why they're occurring. So back to shielding. Remember that shielding is the attraction that an electron, an outer electron, feels from the nucleus. And those in, electrons that are in between kind of block some of that attraction. So what we need to think about when we're doing this, I would pull out my reference table, pause if you don't have it handy, and you want to look at what's happening as we go across and down the periodic table, and it's important to think in terms of protons and electrons. So let's talk about what happens to protons. So think about what happens. Protons increase, right? The atomic number increases, which means that the number of protons are increased as you go from left to right across a period, so across a row. And then you're adding electrons in the outer shell in those first three rows, or if you're in rows four through seven, you're adding them in the D and F subshells. So we've, we've learned about all the different S, P, D, and F. D and F, when we add electrons to those subshells, they don't really do a lot in terms of the shielding. And so they don't really have a big effect. So as you go from left to right across a period, then what happens is the shielding stays about the same. So you're not, the electrons are about the same distance from the nucleus, the inner electrons are not changing, so there's not really any change in shielding. Let's talk about what happens as you go down a, peer, down a column or a, a group or a family. So protons jump up. If you look at the atomic numbers, if you go down the first column, you can see that they jump up pretty quickly. And then you're adding electrons, but you have to think about the fact that you're adding electrons not just in one, uh, that same subshell, you're adding them in, in subshells that are further and further away from the nucleus. And so the number of shells that you're adding increases. So you've got this nucleus, and each time you go down a row, you're adding one of those shells to that. So that shielding increases because there are more and more shells between the outermost electrons and the nucleus each time you drop down a row. So let's look at atomic radius. As you go left to right across the period, we've talked about the fact that the protons increase. And when your, your protons increase, obviously your electrons increase, but because you're going across a row, you're adding those electrons in the same shell. And so they're about the same distance from the nucleus. That shell number kind of tells you how far away they are from the nucleus, those electrons. So if the protons are increasing, think about what's going to happen to the attraction between that positive nucleus, which is getting more positive, and that outermost electron that is negative. It's going to increase if you have more of a positive charge. So the size of the atom is going to it's going to shrink down as that positive charge increases. It's going to pull those negative electrons in closer. So as you go left to right, the atom the radius of the atom decreases. Let's talk about what happens as you go down a family. So the protons we talked about the fact that they kind of jump up. And then we're adding electrons, but we're adding them in shells farther and farther away from the nucleus. And we know each time we add a shell, that size of that atom is going to increase. And so the number of shells increases, obviously the size of the atom is going to increase. So as you go down a family, the atom gets much larger. All right, let's talk about what happens with ionization energy. Remember that that's the amount of energy it takes to remove one electron. So you want to think about, again, that attraction between the protons in the nucleus and those electrons that are farther away, the ones on the outermost shell. So as you go from left to right, we know that the number of protons increases. The atomic radius is smaller, meaning that that electron is much closer to the nucleus that positive nucleus. So think about what that means for the attraction. The attraction is really strong, which means we have to think about how much energy it's going to take. If that attraction is really strong for that electron and that nucleus, it's going to be really hard to pull that electron away from the nucleus. It's going to take a lot of energy. So the ionization energy increases as you go from left to right across a period. As you go down a family, obviously we talked about the atomic radius getting bigger. So as the radius gets bigger, because we're adding those shells of electrons, that outermost electron is getting farther and farther away 
from the nucleus. And so as it gets farther away, that attraction decreases. Think about, have you ever had a couple of magnets from the refrigerator and you were playing with them? And then you bring them really close together and they kind of snap together. The closer those things are, the more attractive they are. Positive and negative things like uh, the protons and the electrons work the same way. So if the electrons are further away, then there's less attraction there. It's much easier to pull off that electron when it's farther away. So the ionization energy decreases as you go down a family. And here's a little kind of a picture example. You can see that not all the elements are on there. The transition metals are not included, but groups uh, groups 1 and 2 and then 3A through 8A are actually 13 through 18. And you can see if you go to the top right, the atom is smaller and so it takes a lot more energy to remove that electron. So helium, neon, those uh, atoms in the upper right hand corner have the highest ionization energy. And as you go left and down, so down where cesium, rubidium, uh, barium, those atoms are in the lower left, you can see that those are much lower ionization energy. And that's because those are such big atoms, it's really much easier to pull off an electron because those electrons are so far away from that positive nucleus. All right, and here's just another way of looking at it. You can see that each one of these lines, not the dotted lines, but the solid lines, represents a period. So the first two dots there on the left helium is at the top and of course hydrogen would be at the bottom but what happens as you go across a row while it's not every time as a general rule the ionization energy increases because the size of the atom is getting smaller when you look at those last two sets of data on the right with the green dots those are the transition metals and we've talked about the fact that those d and f electrons don't really have a big impact on the shielding or the amount of attraction between those outer electrons and the nucleus and that's where that shows so that you see the ionization energy isn't really affected a whole lot by that. Let's talk about electronegativity. Remember the electronegativity of an atom is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself in a compound so it has to be in a compound. So as you go from left to right across a period, think about the size. The protons are increasing, the atomic radius decreases, so that atom is getting smaller. And if it's a smaller atom, it's going to be able to attract electrons to its nucleus much more easily because the nucleus of that little atom is going to be much closer to the outer electrons of the atom next to it than the if it's a much larger atom, okay? So that means that the electronegativity increases. So if you can remember the trend for atomic radius, left to right it gets smaller. Smaller atom means the electronegativity increases. It's easier for an atom to attract electrons to itself. It also means ionization energy increases because it's harder to pull off an electron. So if you can remember those trends, you can remember atomic radius, the other two are opposite. As you go from top to bottom down a family, we talked about the fact that atomic radius gets larger, those outer electrons are being added further and further away from the nucleus, and that electronegativity decreases. So the bigger the atom is, the farther its nucleus is away from the electrons in the atom next to it in a compound. So that's why, again, the atomic radius increases as we go down a family, but the electronegativity decreases, so it's the opposite trend. Ionization energy follows the same trend as electronegativity. And you can see, this is another just visual example, in the upper right hand corner, you can see that fluorine has a really high electronegativity. It's a very small atom and it's easy to attract, it's easy for fluorine uh, atoms to attract electrons to themselves. Now, if you look down here in the lower left, you can see these big atoms, cesium, rubidium, those things, they're much larger, and so they are having a much harder time attracting electrons to themselves when they're in a compound with other elements. And you'll notice that there are, the a family is missing here, so think about why that might be. Those are the noble gases. 
they don't make compounds with other elements, so they do not have an electronegativity. The important part of that definition is that they attract electrons to themselves from other atoms in compounds. They have to be in compounds. So let's try a couple of practice problems together. This is what a typical problem looks like. It'll ask you to arrange a list of elements in order. There are seven here. And it'll, it'll be by one of the properties, atomic radius, uh, ionization energy, or electronegativity. In this case, we have seven elements that we need to arrange. So we need to look at the periodic table to think about the direction of the trend. So we know that we want to start, if it's increasing atomic radius, we need to start with the one that has the smallest radius. So we need to think about that trend. We know that as we go from left to right, atomic radius decreases. And as we go from top to bottom, atomic radius increases. So at the top right are the smallest elements. At the bottom left are the largest elements. Remember that radius for an atom means size. So we want to start where the smallest elements are in the upper right-hand corner, and then we want to move to the bottom left-hand corner. Now, I'm not going to try to give you any tricky problems that won't work. They should be very straightforward. So let's look at where these elements are. So let's start with the one that is in the upper right. The smallest atom is going to be helium. Let's go ahead and mark that off the list. That way you don't forget one. And I leave a little space when I'm doing these just to make sure I can squeeze one in if I need to. The, we want to go in order of increasing atomic radius. So as you go down and left on the periodic table, so down towards that lower left corner, atoms are getting larger. So you want to find the one that's either down left or down and left from the one that you're on. And so neon is the next closest one. So let's mark that one off our list. See if you can find the next one. I think it's oxygen. My pen's getting a little crazy there. And then after oxygen, the next one that comes after that is arsenic. And you can see arsenic is down here. It's not right below. It is just below and left of oxygen. So let's mark arsenic off our list. And then if you look, germanium GE is directly to the left, so let's put that on our list. And then the next one would be SN, which is 10 right below germanium. And then after that, we only have barium left. And you can see we've kind of skipped these transition metals, and that's how these problems will typically work. Skip the transition metals, but barium is over here, and it is below and left of 10. So that's going to be our last one. Go ahead and mark it off the list so you can make sure you did all of them. Let's try another one. All right, so here's another problem. This one's asking us to arrange the elements in order of increasing electronegativity. And again, there are seven elements here. So let's look at this one on the periodic table. Think about the trend for electronegativity. Remember that electronegativity gets larger as you move from left to right, and it gets smaller as you go from top to bottom. So the elements that have the largest electronegativities are the ones in the upper right hand corner. The ones that have the smallest electronegativity because they're the largest atoms are in the lower left hand corner. So we want to choose the element that is closest to the lower left hand corner to start. So if you look down here at, at our list we can see that rubidium is the furthest to the left and so we're going to start with that element. And then if you continue to look at our list, the one that's next is strontium. We want to move up, right, or up and right. So uh, strontium is just to the right, so we're going to put that next. And then after strontium, we're going to go up and right. So if we go up, 
Here's magnesium. Now you can see aluminum is over here. This one is only up. This one is up and also right. So magnesium is actually the one that goes next in order. So mark that off your list. And then the next one, because it's right of magnesium, will be aluminum. After aluminum, we have to look, we've got phosphorus, oxygen, and fluorine. You can see that phosphorus is in the same row, oxygen, fluorine are to the right and above. So we're going to go ahead and put phosphorus next. Mark that off our list. Then uh, oxygen, because it's to the right and above. And then fluorine is the one furthest to the right, so that would be our last one. And that would be the correct answer to the problem. If you're trying these problems and having any trouble, let me know. I'll see you in class.